Hello and welcome to this Facebook Live for the Ricina Dialogue 2020. Uh, this session will discuss uh, peace and stability in South and Southwest Asia. Joining me here today on the panel is Sayed Kazem Sajadpour, who's the Deputy Foreign uh, Minister of Iran, and uh, Saad Mohseni, businessman and a media mogul in the region as well. Thank you both for joining us here on the panel. Um, so I'd like to begin with you. Um, when we talk about peace and stability in the region, uh, if you speak to your neighbors, they would accuse Iran, many of your neighbors, of um, attempting regional hegemony in, in the region. I mean, they, they would say that that's the real issue here, rather than anything else, that you're attempting to spread your dominance across the region. How would you respond to that? Uh, I would say it's not something to start with. Uh, if you want to talk about the regional uh, security frames, first of all, uh, of course I address what you said, but I think the most important issue in our region is American hegemony uh, and attempts by an international hegemon to rule the, the region. And uh, paradoxically, this hegemon is very confused. Uh, you see the most let's say, confused moment in the history of American hegemony in the region. Look what's going on in Afghanistan. 18 months ago, 18 years ago, they came on this agenda that we want to get rid of Taliban. Now they are negotiating with Taliban. I'm not going to judge on the quality of negotiation. What I'm saying is you are dealing with an external hegemon, which is completely so confused. Iran's, now let's, Iran's let's, let's go to what you, you said. Iran is no hegemon. We are against hegemony because we think hegemony is not working. But there is one important issue, uh, which is maybe a uh, base of this misjudgment, and that is the size of Iran. You know, Iran is a regional power by the size. We have 15 neighbors. We have been there are four centuries. We live with our neighbors together. And uh, I think, of course, some of our neighbors uh, differ from the other, differ from us in terms of population, size, uh, power indices, and so on and so forth. You cannot equate the size, this, uh, the legitimate security concerns with uh, hegemony. Hegemony is used sometimes as a propaganda uh, for, by international hegemons. Well, what's I mean, it? but if, yeah. you, if you look at the role of the Quds Force, for example, across yeah. the region, I mean, militias are being empowered in certain parts of the region, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, um, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, um, which are being empowered by the Quds Force, being trained um, to sometimes be more powerful than the actual armies of the country. Uh, here, I think, uh, first of all, you have to consider that Case by case, they differ. I mean, the case of, I don't mean just about what you call militia. The case of Lebanon is very different from the case of Iraq. case of Iraq is very different from uh, Syria. So each of them have their own logic, their own dynamism, and the contextuality that if you take into account, you see it's not just one single factor analysis that it is what's. I think it's a combination of so many variables related to each of these contextuality. Furthermore, if you look at the broader picture, you see Iran is helping the countries based on their own invitation request for its own uh, security plus the security of others based on one single assumption that our security is linked to the security of Iraq. And I give you one vivid example, or, or our neighbors at large. When ISIS was taking care, uh, was uh, on the verge of taking over a lot of other uh, Iraqi cities, they were very close to Iranian cities, Iranian borders. So if they had overtaken other cities than Mosul, you see what would happen, happen not just to Iraq, to Iran and to Afghanistan. 
and we'll, to the region. We'll bring in Afghanistan, yeah. um, Saad. What's been Afghanistan's response uh, to the current volatilities um, that Iran is facing? Well, Afghanistan is in a very strange place in that it has a strategic alliance with the U.S. and relies very much on U.S. support, uh, financial and military. And at the same time, we're right next to Iran, where we share a history, culture, religion, language. And, um, and, and they have to you know, manage that, that these two relationships. It's very delicate. And I think um, under President Karzai, I think that he managed to balance it pretty well. I think the uh, President Ghani, I, I think, uh, did the right things. Uh, he obviously made it very clear to the Americans and spoke to Pompeo about Afghan territory not uh, being used against any of our neighbors. And he also reached out to the Iranians. Uh, he spoke to President Rouhani, offered his condolences. Uh, it's important for us to, to maintain that sort of neutrality. But what's important for the Afghans is that uh, we're next to Iran, and we'll be next. We've been there for hundreds of years, and we'll be there for hundreds more years. And the perception in Afghanistan is that the Americans will eventually leave. Um, so we have to maintain our relationship with the Iranians, uh, with the Iranian government and the Iranian people. So it's a very delicate balancing act uh, that we have to maintain. And I think that the Afghan government probably said and did the right things. However, uh, the jury's out in terms of what's going to happen next. But it's a two-way street. At the same time, we expect from our Iranian friends not to use Afghanistan or the Afghan territory in their uh, cold or now hot war against the Americans. Um, you know, we've, we've been kicked around for the last uh, 40 years since the uh, Russians invaded Afghanistan um, by the international powers and regional powers. And Afghans, I, I think, are hoping that the Iranians will play a constructive role in terms of peace talks. Uh, can, even you, in, can you tell us where we're at with peace talks at the moment? I, I, think, I think that we're pretty close to, to the Taliban committing to some sort of reduction in violence. It, it could happen within days. And that would then, I think that the agreement is that there'll be 10 days of, of reduced violence the agreements between the Americans and the Taliban and between the Americans and the Afghan government will be signed. There'll be another 10 days of relative calm, and then you'll have intra-Afghan talks. And I think this is where Iran can also play a constructive role, as they did uh, after Bonn. Uh, the, the Americans relied to an extent on, the, on Iranian cooperation uh, in 2001 that enabled uh, the toppling of the Taliban regime. So I think that there is... Afghanistan could be used as an opportunity in terms of uh, what the Americans and the Iranians can do. Does Mr. Sajidpour have a point when he says, you know, we've come full circle here. The Americans first went in to get rid of the Taliban and now they're trying to negotiate peace with them. Yes. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, it's, it's been a, a war. It's, it's gone on for 19 years. Unfortunately, it's been 19 different wars. Uh, with the, with, with the Americans resetting every war every single year. So there's been no clear strategy in terms of what they wanted in Afghanistan. It's been very tactical. Um, we have come a full circle. And unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, it's become apparent that the war cannot be won uh, on the battlefield. Have you had any assurances? I mean, one of the things at stake is the free press and the media. Mm -hmm. Has your outlet had any assurances that should a Taliban come back into the fold, the, a political agreement, that achievements like yours will be safeguarded? No, that we, we have had no assurance. They've said that they've changed and they're willing to consider it and they will discuss it when the, uh, when, when the talks start between the Afghan sides. But um, the Taliban are very committed to their ideology and their interpretation of, of how they see Islam. Uh, it doesn't give us much room in terms of women's rights or media rights and so forth. And they're still insisting on the emirate of Islam. And I think that's, you know, this, it's, it's going to be a very long and difficult, you know, 18 months or two years before the two sides can find a middle ground, I think. Mr. Sajid, I mean, Sal's so talking about Iran's role in all of this. How does Iran see itself positioned going forward if a negotiation is reached with the Taliban and they are brought back in some way or shape back into Kabul? I think, first of all, let me emphasize that uh, Afghanistan for Iran is very, very important and very dear. And look what happened just last week in the crashdown uh, 
uh, of this uh, airplane. We had also our Afghani uh, friends and families mourning like Iranians who lost their families. So the connectivity between Iran and Afghanistan is so deep. No other country in our neighborhood is like Afghanistan. It's not just the language. I think it's, uh, life is so uh, connected in a way. So the future of Afghanistan is very important for us. I think what's important for Iran is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan as a political outcome of a long uh, uh, way of interactions between different parties. Afghanistan has a constitution. I think this constitution is a very important achievement. And it has a, a democratic process, uh, minorities' right, women right, uh, inclusiveness of, of the system. Uh, it has a state, it has a government. I think these are the factors which are very important for us and it cannot be uh, really uh, taken out of the picture because of some, let's say, uh, uh, other interactions going on. In the meantime, Taliban is an actor among the other actors in, in Afghanistan. So combining together, security of Afghanistan is very, very important. And I think also the achievements of Afghanistan during the last uh, 18, 19 years should be taken uh, very seriously. How is Iran going to deal with the unrest within the country? We're seeing, we've been seeing demonstrations for months. And they have been, uh, there has been quite a hard crackdown on, on civilians who have been protesting. Several hundred people were killed. Uh, I think it's a very, uh, if you want uh, to have a complete and thorough uh, answer, you have to differentiate between different, different demonstrations. Uh, and you should not be selective. We had also a demonstration for uh, killing and assassinating of General Soleimani. I think were it you was surprised by the way in which the Americans killed him? I think uh, we were surprised, but we were also uh, highly uh, shocked by the uh, lies, actions, illegality, irrationality of, uh, of this decision. But look, we had demonstration all over Iran uh, in support of uh, uh, the late general. And I have to say we had it all over the region, including in India, as our foreign minister said, in more than 400 cities. So demonstrations are there. And I think what I witnessed, you know, I was young when revolution was going on. So I'm uh, from generation of demonstration. I've seen but what I saw in uh, the death of uh, General Soleimani was uh, really very unique. Uh, and the protesters who were angry And now. then we had a, a, a protestation in uh, some cities two months ago. And then we had just uh, two, three days ago. I think they differentiate with each other. The uh, previous two months ago uh, was shaped based on the increase in the price of gasoline, but there were also distractions. So the dominant narrative in Iran is that the grievances of the people should be taken seriously and right. Mm. That means people have the right to express their grievances, but distractions of the buildings and manipulation of this by external forces or whatever forces that we have uh, is, is not acceptable. That was mostly by, let's say, uh, economic reasons. But this one is uh, for transparency, that why uh, there was uh, n n not uh, announcement on time on the reason, and p uh, the officials are providing answers. I think qualitatively these three uh, are, different. are different. And I think, I think the system is... Uh, uh, is a strong. It's not just selectively look, but look at was one single uh, demonstration or, uh, and say, "Oh, this is the end of it." It's the wish of uh, Pompeo and you know Trump to just to be selectively look into some I, of the I just want to. I just want to ask um, Saad one last question. We've got about thirty seconds to go. I mean, we have um, over a hundred Afghans killed daily. What needs to now happen to make that stop? Do you think that it's inevitable that an agreement with the Taliban needs to be reached? You've got 
15 seconds. <laughs> well, I think the hope is that uh, when, when they reduce violence and they start talking, that that could lead, that will gain, that there'll be a momentum of sorts for peace talks. So the hope is, and fingers crossed, uh, I think it's a 50-50 thing. Sad. Uh, Mr. Sajid Pro, thank, thank you, you both for joining us. And that ends our Facebook Live here for the Racing Dialogue. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.